Now, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Gutman's Garage, and it's a movie review, of course. And we're going to talk to Steve Gutman about a couple of movies. We're going to compare movies about art and the Holocaust, which are both very interesting, but one, and I'll tell you later which one, is better than the other. Okay, in a moment, we'll get right into it. The Art Dealer and the Woman in Gold uh, with uh, Steve Goodman. So, Steve, you know, we we're going to just do The Art Dealer, but you said, hey, why don't we compare the two, The Art Dealer and The Woman in Gold, which are both very interesting movies. Um, let's, let's go to the one we originally discussed, The Art Dealer. What's the story there? Well, the story actually, in one sense, is the same in both films, in that you've got a family that owned extensive amount of art and the nazis basically stole the art and now after the after the war is over um many years after the war is over uh the family is, is trying to recover the art or at least some members of the family in the art dealer because one of the differences between the two films is is that the the search for the art is, is really um, the, the granddaughters of the one the one individual's efforts, where in the woman in gold, it while well, focusing on on the granddaughter, um, it, it, it's it is more of a family being united in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, but it's it, uh, it the art dealer is is a French family, and and the film is. In a lot of ways, very much like the very French film, and it so the way it goes about presenting the uh, the issues is, is extremely different than what what appears in women what appears in women in gold. Is the art dealer true? There, there it, it's based on a, a particular family, but it it. It, it is significantly fiction. Um, both films modify the, the reality that actually was occurring. Mm. So um, my my view of the art dealer was uh, I was like mm, not particularly excited about it. Um, I uh, I thought that the um, the woman who does the investigation. She's not all that persuasive to me as an investigator. Um, but, you know, one, one review I saw put it in one sentence, which I thought was interesting. This is the story. The art dealer is the story of a French Jewish family eating itself. <laughs> it, it wasn't just against the backdrop of the Holocaust. It was against the backdrop of this French family. They were cheating themselves. You know, they were stealing, keeping secrets from each other. Uh, they were trying to capitalize on the Holocaust. And, that was, you know, that was, uh, that was a bit of a surprise. You know, usually the recipe is, uh, you know, the Nazis stole the art. It wasn't that simple in the art dealer. Because oh, one, guy, oh. one guy got a corner on the art, didn't tell the others, and he lied about it. And ultimately, this, uh, this journalist woman... Uh, kept on investigating, and she found out that he was the culprit, and that he had benefited and became very wealthy um, by by effectively stealing the art from the others. Yeah, the family itself is is is, uh, is a very divided family, <laughs> to say the least. Um, yeah. And there, there's also an element in terms of what's going on with the the whole gov French government and and just the um, interplay between acknowledging the fact that uh, significant numbers of people cooperated with Vichy fans as as opposed to um, they're just simply uh, being popular myth that the majority of French people were were opposed to the Nazi. Um, you have a bit of that, that same argument being presented in women in gold too. Uh, that the, the present 
feeling is, is, is that people want to feel that the Austrians were opposed to the Nazi when film makes it clear in a lot of ways that significant numbers, probably a majority, were actually very supportive of what was happening with, with, with the Nazi. Well, it was, it was pretty Jews. sinister, as I remember. Um, the guy was um, uh, related to the true owner of the art, Jewish fellow owned it. Um, and he he turned him in, he collaborated on him and turned him into the Nazis, set him up. And then uh, his the the fellow who would would get got turned in had a wife. and this uh, this bad guy, part of the family, he had designs on the wife and the art. Yes, and, he wanted it. And he he wound up courting the wife after the fellow he turned in got got sent to a prison camp or a death camp. And so now he's courting the wife and he marries the wife and he inherits the art from the wife. Um, it's all really awful. And 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 he doesn't really and oh, and then he becomes an art dealer and he makes these grandiose gestures. Uh, about giving away a small fraction of it, but he doesn't tell the family about how much more he has. And um, when you when she starts peeling off the layers on this, it's really awful. It's an awful story. I mean, he, he killed he killed his relative so he could marry a wife he coveted, and then steal the art from the husband and the wife. What a guy. Um, hmm. I guess you know it's it's much more than you know than the pulp Nazi story about the Nazi stealing the art. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, that that's that's what I was saying. Uh, it, it, it's it's a very French story. I mean, with with the sex element in, into it, um, you know, the, the but but the the whole focus is on a very limited number of people and their interactions mm -hmm. where. Women in, in gold is, is is kind of telling the broader story um, in terms of the contrast between the two. Yeah, but you have to admire the. Uh, I guess she was a journalist. Um, you know her determination to find out what happened. Nobody would cooperate with her. And as a matter of fact, um, you know the the, the thief um, who was very wealthy and powerful. You know, decades later. Um, had her terminated from her job um, because uh, she was getting at a newspaper uh, right. because she was getting too close to the truth and he wanted to stop her. And, he, and then he tried to kind of buy her off by uh, telling her that he could get her job back uh, for her because he was friendly with um, the fellow who owned the newspaper. It was all very totally manipulative and and what you had was a kind of, you know, silent a conspiracy of silence then and later, uh, where this one person, this one man, was, uh, you know, guilty of so many offenses. Um, it, it was discomforting. It wasn't. It wasn't what you expected. That's for sure. And she, no, she was no big deal. Uh, you know, I didn't think she was all that good an actress or pretty. I didn't think that. Uh, you know, this was a a travelogue for life in Paris, that's for sure. It was a dark movie. Right, and with the subtitles, I mean, it, so you had to really keep concentrating in order to, to really know what was happening. Uh, unless you spoke French. Uh, you know, you, you really had to, you had to keep your eyes on the, on the camera. Well, I had the same experience, Steve. You know, I mean, I know a little French, and uh, I, I usually use a French movie as a way to you know, pick out the words and learn and, and and feel, you know, the beat of the language. But in this case, they were talking so fast and mumbling all the time, um, you know, and having these kind of private uh, conversations that, you know, you couldn't really hear the French at all. And, and the uh, subtitles were the only way you'd understand any of it. Um, but the subtitles were moving so fast that it was it was imperfect. Uh, your understanding of what they were saying and what they were doing was imperfect. I guess. Mark Golan was a fellow who made the movie. 
He's he's controversial, Mark Olin, uh, as a movie maker and as a, uh, you know a, a political animal. Um, and so I, you have to take all of that into account. So I guess yeah. it was interesting. It was interesting to see it. It was a little bit surprising about where it took you. Um, I guess the, if I had to think of the, a takeaway, it would be something like uh, even ordinary people uh, who want to find out what happened, uh, who are mm, courageous and determined, uh, they can find out what happened. And Lord knows there's plenty of things to discover about what happened with valuable art during World War II. Yeah, I mean, there's still an awful lot of art that is in, in people's hands that really it, it, it's it's not really theirs. Um, and the, the way in which they got it was really tied back to, to the Nazis. Um, you know, I think there, there's still a fair amount of uh, a work being done trying to, by various families, trying to recover artwork. What, what's interesting about the, the woman in gold is they know they knew exactly where the where the art piece was, um, and in fact, all the art that was in question. And it was it was a, an issue of, of of how do you get it away from from the Austrian government um, and the control. That they had over, over the art. So it's a, a little bit different as opposed to the the art dealer where it was all in private hands. Steve, let's let's talk now about the second movie. We've been uh, we've alluded to it, and certainly there are common denominators that you know have to be mentioned. But the Woman in Gold is an American movie, also made within the last few years, uh, and it, it was quite a remarkable movie. It was it was popular. Uh, it was a, I don't know if it won awards, but it certainly was an excellent movie. And uh, it's an excellent story. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a story with an ending that, you know, is somewhat gratifying. Um, and it, uh, uh, it involved real people. I mean, it's, uh, I know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fictionalized to some extent, but to a large extent, it's a true story about a woman uh, called Maria Altman, who was part of the family that owned uh, a bunch of very valuable paintings uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And, and uh, they, it's not that the Nazis stole them. The Nazis made it so hard for people to keep them uh, that at the end of the day, um, they had to give it up under pressure. And, and, and it wended its way through the market for, uh, 50, 60 years until justice could be done. Um, and Maria Altman was uh, a, a part of that family. And uh, I must say that she was the star of the show because she was so determined that she was star, the star of the story, too. Uh, and, you know, it, it strikes me, per our conversation a minute ago, that it's, it's remarkable in that you know this happened many times over in Europe, in Austria, in Germany, where art was somehow, you know, dislocated uh, because of the Nazis, if not directly. Uh, in this case, there was a happy ending, but in so many other cases, that art is, you know, it's out there somewhere, untraceable, and the people who should own it have no clue where it is, and not, they can't do much about it. Um, so uh, the oh. other thing I wanted to, you know, ask you to wend into this uh, is is the um, the story of uh, uh, Schoenberg, the lawyer, which is uh, repeated in many YouTube videos. He he's a lawyer in California now in Los Angeles. Right. He was a young lawyer right out of school when this happened, and um, Maria Altman was, I guess, his relative, and she well, not appealed. legally. But uh, she, she and, uh, was the best friend of his mother. And, and they both escaped and got to Southern California uh, in the early stages of the, of, of the war, World War II. And they remained friends. And, and so when, when Austria enacted a, a statute that would have appeared to give an opening as as to 
people getting their art back. Um, she then contacted her friend who, who then said, talk, talk to my son. Um, and he was pretty fresh, apparently out of law school. Uh, the, the movie's not really clear exactly how, how long he'd, he'd been practicing, but you get the sense that it had been a, he was he was pretty much a novice, but uh, he scored quite a victory in his first major case. It goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in fact, the the interaction with the, the scene at, with the U.S. Supreme Court was was that was kind of entertaining. Actually, had had some almost comedy to it, which is was was not so much true throughout the film, but it was it was a nice sense of relief. Um, in the, in the, in those, in those, in those scenes. Well, he was a great speaker in the, uh, the YouTube that, uh, that, that I saw and that you saw, I think. One thing at Irvine. Yeah. Excuse me. University of California, San Diego. Yeah. I think was. So, uh, and he, you know, he told the story factually and, and well. And when you compare the story he told, and, and he told you when the movie, you know, went off the side, when it was fictionalized, it wasn't that many times. It wasn't for that many points. So when, when you heard it from the, you know, the horse's mouth with him, um, you realize that the movie was pretty accurate. Uh, and, you know, people, those were the people, and that's how they conducted themselves. And, you know, that's how it wended its way through the courts. So, you know, Schoenberg um, uh, speeches, and there's more than one, there's a number of them. He's been a, a popular speaker in California and nationally. Um, you know, uh, is, is, a, is a great roadmap for the movie. And the movie is, um, you know, essentially true. My wife and oh, I yeah. went, to, went to the, uh, the gallery in New York. Where louder, 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 you know, the, Chris, the louder the uh, makeup Authentic. company, yeah, Estee yeah. Louder, um, uh, bought the, ultimately bought this painting. He must have spent a fortune. Nobody told, nobody says how much he spent, but uh, he must have spent a fortune with all of the notoriety this painting has had. And we saw it. And it's very interesting because they have two places in the gallery where you can see it. One is, the real painting, which is um, framed by some statues they found that were that framed it in the original presentation in Vienna, uh, in in uh, the, the house of the family, um, and the other is a copy. Um, and there are so many people come around to this louder gallery that they go and see the copy because it's not so crowded. You <laughs> like the Mona Lisa, you know. Right. It's, it's, it's very interesting how popular it is, and it is a beautiful painting for sure. Um, and it tells, you know, it tells the story of the time of the early twentieth century and the in the kind of literati uh, of of the Jewish community, the um, the intelligentsia of the Jewish community in uh, Vienna at the time. They really lived a good life. And, and he, you know, he, Schoenberg, talks about, you know, how long did that go on? And the answer is the, there was Don't a period. Short. Yes, well, there was a period of enlightenment um, for the Jews in Austria. And they were not really permitted to do business. Um, and at some point, uh, I guess it was the fall of the um, Austrian, uh, Austrian, Austrian yeah, uh, Hungarian Empire. Empire that they all of a sudden now they could do business. They started, you know, doing business and they did well. Um, but the fall of the empire and you know, and World War One and then two, it wasn't that long. So that you know, what you get is a bunch of people who were uh, essentially bourgeoisie uh, because they had they had recent wealth, and the, the rest the wealth was impressive and and they focused on you know this family anyway. They focused on this art and Klimt was um, a, a favorite and uh, he was a favorite even then. And they, they bought up a lot of his art and they had him paint, you know, some of their family members. This was, um, you know, old fashioned aristocratic salon uh, where they were, you know, befriending the artist.
one of the, the small things that they did change, I mean, they focused totally on on the woman in gold painting. In reality, there there were five paintings um, that the fight was about, and and all five paintings were were recovered as a result of, of the of, of, of the of the lawsuit um, and the the arbitration award. That was pretty gutsy of, of of the attorney to really be willing to go back to Austria um, and do the and do the arbitration in in Austria. Um, but he also points out he had a client who at that point was 88 or 89 years old, and whether she really would would live if, if, he, if he did a, a traditional legal fight in the United States. Um, the odds of her still being alive were were, were not that good. So. Yeah, well, also, you, you know, you're not fighting small fry. You're fighting the country of Austria. Uh, and, and, and in the country of Austria, the museums belong to the country of Austria. And the museum wanted this. Um, and in fact, you know, the painting had at that point never left Austria. It was it was uh, painted in Austria. It was uh, shown in, in these private homes in Vienna. Um, and it was kept in the war in, in Austria. So that um, Austria felt that it had a real connection with these paintings, and it wasn't about to give them up easy. So it it fought Schoenberg at every turn, um, and it was remarkable. Got the State Department to join in. Um, yeah, the State the Department fight. was on the other side. Yeah, yeah. So here's this young lawyer, not only fighting the Austrian government, but also has to be fighting against it, against the U.S. government, who was not pleased with how he was interpreting. The uh, the U.S. statute on, on on suing foreign countries. Yeah, and it's also an interpretation question on exactly what the uh, the will of uh, what was her name uh, Adela, right, uh, said, um, and and how the language in the will worked, and who uh, whether she owned the paintings or her husband owned the paintings, and. There was the law in Austria about uh, you know primacy in favor of the the husband, and the language in the will was uh, am, am, ambiguous. And uh, he really had to go through every issue in the book, um, aside from the jurisdictional questions. But somehow, I, you know, and it, the, it makes it clear in the movie how remarkable this was. Somehow, the country of Austria um, decided that they would mm, arbitrate. Um, they could have held him up, as you said, until his client died. Um, but but no, they agreed to arbitrate and uh, to an arbitration by a panel of arbitrators in Austria. Uh, and and he won the arbitration, which was remarkable because, you know, uh, Austria was actually, you know, um, against, it was against the Austrian interest. And they yeah, ruled against the themselves. Nothing. Yeah. Right, it was a three nothing vote. It was one of those things where the arbitration was one side picks an arbitrator, the other side picks an arbitrator, and those two arbitrators pick the third one. But uh, not only did, did he win over the independent um, and the one that he picked, I mean, the actual one that the Austrian government had to sign ended up voting in his favor. So, I mean, that, that was one heck of a presentation. Yeah, well, surprising, you know, to him anyway, that the Austrians would be so. Uh, tolerant, understanding, considerate of his client. He thought they would, you know, uh, take every possible step to keep the art. Uh, and remember, too, the Anschluss and the, the feelings of the Austrians about the Germans in those days, you know, they were not unfriendly to them. Anschluss was a voluntary surrender of territory. It's not like the uh, Blitzkrieg or anything. Oh, no. And um, so he felt Rocky. that there were Nazis in the crowd, you know, and there a lot of conservative people um, had stayed in Austria, still are in Austria, and were tolerant of the, you know, the Nazi uh, legacy. So, um, you know, it was a surprise. But as you said, his client Maria was, you know, aging out here, and he didn't want to take the chance of um, losing her. It, w it was remarkable. Uh, the, the whole legal experience for him was remarkable. It should stand as a, you know, a beacon for every young lawyer. Uh, and I do remember, you know, he was with a big law firm somewhere in the West Coast. Well, um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the L.A. branch of, of, the, of the New York City law firm. 
Yes. Sergeant Sides Driver. That's right. Was, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and he was working on this case and they didn't like it. They thought it was a pie in the sky. He was never going to, you know, make any money with it. And he said, I'm sorry, I really care about this case. I'm out of here. So he quit the law firm and, and did it solo. Um, later on, you know, he, he created another law firm and uh, he's with that law firm today. He's still a young man. This all happened, you know, within the last, what, 20 years, if that. Um, so he's a, he's a hero. And, and his comments uh, that he made in the one um, uh, YouTube video that I so enjoyed, which was in the, what, the San Diego Museum, I think it was, um, was so articulate, so easy to listen to. Uh, my wife and I were, you know, watching it, entranced by how this guy right. could tell a story. Usually lawyers tell technical stories about their adventures in the law. You know, you fall asleep. Not this case. No, he talked about the, the family itself and just um, you know, the other artwork that, that they had. I mean, they had that porcelain collection. Uh, the, the, the family had the largest porcelain collection of any, any, any anybody anywhere. I mean, that that's one heck of a lot of wealth. Uh, the the cello was well, it was a Stravinsky, and it was. Uh, I mean, it, the, the, the amount that they had acquired amount of wealth is uh, it's, it's hard to imagine. Uh, but, but you know, the the whole experience with uh, World War II and the Nazis and the way uh, they were treated in, you know, Kristallnacht and thereafter and all those people in the family uh, being murdered in the camps uh, uh, and, and separated from their property, from their homes. A number of them, you know, couldn't, wouldn't go back. Uh, there was one relative he talked about who went to uh, Switzerland, never returned to Austria, never re, 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 regained his property, his, his home, any of his personal effects, his art. So, I mean, the discombobulation was huge to this family. If they were nouveau, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, life in the, the salons of, uh, you know, Vienna, um, by the time the war was over, they were they were just middle class. They didn't have it left. And, I, you know, Maria Oakman, middle class, she didn't have any significant wealth. She couldn't afford Schoenberg. Uh, right. Well, so, that was part of her problem. I mean, and now she ended up doing the, the U.S. lawsuit was that the, the amount of money she was going to have to post it to, to pursue the, the legal litigation in Austria was $1.8 million. Yeah. Um, uh, this is the lady that's, that's, that's collecting, uh, well, she's out of social security, but she had, she had a little, a little, a little dress shop. Um, right. you know, how much money could, could she possibly have been making? Oh, she was uh, marginal. And so that's what makes the story so interesting. Uh, when you see them, you know, at the turn of the century, so successful and such a, you know, an integrated family and buying art and porcelain and what have you, and then all of a sudden reduced to, you know, nothing. They were a lot happy to get out with their lives. And many of them, many of them didn't. Many of them were, were killed. So that's, it makes the story, it, it roots the story in, in the, the Nazi uh, takeover in Austria. It roots the story in great art. Uh, it roots the story in the Holocaust. And it roots the story in modern day law, international law, which is, un you and I know, it's unpredictable, you know? It's hard to find international, it's elusive. And uh, he managed to find it. I mean, it's a, it was a matter of luck, I think, uh, both at the Supreme Court level uh, and ultimately at, at the arbitration uh, in Austria. Uh, exciting for a lawyer to watch, but I think exciting for everybody to watch it. It's a classic well, it's statement a lawyer, in but... history. I mean, the, the, the law is, it, it is totally integrated with the, the storytelling, but it's not a, it's not a legal drama. Um, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's much more about a family and, and how, how to regain what, what had been lost. That's stolen in this case, not lost. Yeah. Um, it, it's, well, but remember the thing, they were forced to sell. That, that was the... A big issue there. They were 
they were under pressure to sell. Oh, I remember now. They had been taxed. And the tax was an exorbitant tax. Yeah. The fellow who left for Switzerland um, had was was able to get the, the various people that owed, owed the company that he owned, um, picked up all of that, that money. And the Nazis weren't 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 at all happy about that. So they basically were claiming a tax liability. And and that was their excuse for uh, taking the various property properties that they took. Yeah. So there was so much pressure on them they had to sell at at uh, giveaway prices. And they uh Schoenberg argued later that uh, those the, the the pressure to sell was tantamount to taking the art away from them because the tax was uh, really unlawful uh, unlawful and and uh it was confiscatory and it left the family with no options um but to sell <clears throat> it's a sad story but it, i'm sure it played out many times uh in austria and in germany and other countries in poland too for example yeah so, uh, I, I loved the movie. I, I loved The Woman in Gold. I loved it when I saw it. I loved going to see. That's why my wife and I went to see the one in the Louder Museum uh, in New York. Uh, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to sort of touch that. I, I don't mean touch it physically, but we wanted right, to be right, close right. to it and right. enjoy it and, and see what it really looked like. And uh, it was it was worth the trip uh, going to that museum and seeing that art. So the whole thing, you know, it's like you and me, our lifetimes, um, there's something relevant about this movie, about, you know, knowing people, studying what happened in the war, um, studying the law, uh, seeing how things work now. Uh, it sort of brought the whole century together, didn't it? Right. No, it, it was. Um, and there was, as you said, there, there was little things that they changed from the reality. Um, but I don't think it it really make, made, makes a big difference in terms of the major story they were they were telling. Um, the reality was um, in the movie, M Maria leaves before her father dies. The reality was she she did uh, stay in Austria until the father died, and that and then she she and her husband did the es escape. Uh, but it, it, it's like one piece, five pieces in terms of the art. Um, you know, it, the, the the central story is is is, is about the the family it, itself and how they interact. And, um, it's very different than the French version. Uh, Isn't that true? Yeah. This is a family. This is a family that was uh, so tight be, before, during, and after. Uh, and you you really cared about them. They cared about each other. And and Schoenberg had all these uh, old time photographs of the family together. You know the group shots of various members of the family, and it was very touching to see uh, how they lived and cared for each other. And you you wanted to meet them. After oh you, yeah, you yeah. wanted to you wanted to know these people. Which is exactly the opposite of the French family. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, who, who do you want to go have a beer with afterward? Yeah, exactly. Not the French family or the glass of wine <laughs> um, in French. Um, they were so mean to each other in, 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 the, in the case of uh, the movie. So what did you think of the acting? Uh, and, you know, in the movie as a, you know, a production values question, how, how did you think uh, that the woman in gold did? Well, the lady who played, played uh, Maria, I think you know she did. You know, Helen, uh, what's Helen's last name? Helen um, Murren. Yeah, she she did just an excellent job. Um, you know, she did get nominated for for various awards. You know, for for her performance in the film. Um, the actor, um, it was very believable who played the uh, lawyer. Um, you know that that came across. Um, the acting was, was, I think, a very good quality. Um, the uh, uh, as as opposed to the art dealer, I I, I agree with your uh, your comments about the the lead actors. Um, you know, 
you 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 really you, you like what what she was trying to do, but you you really never felt very very strongly about her personally. Um, yeah, there were there were no heroes, really. I, I mean, the woman, the the art dealer, the the, the, the investigator woman. I mean, you had to admire her for her determination, but um, she wasn't she wasn't a heroine particularly no. to me. Uh, in the no. case of uh, the woman in gold, there was a bunch of heroes there, uh, and you could care about them and feel and feel them and be with them and so forth. Yeah, because I mean, Helen Mirren is a fantastic actress. Yes, she is. And and the fact that you know she was at various points, you know, was willing to give up, just got tired. I mean, it was it was a very human uh, reaction to her were occurring. Uh, yeah. You can just imagine somebody after all those years at that age just saying, enough already. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, the one, one of the few things that really bothered me about the film is the fact that, that he, he went and filed the lawsuit and the way they presented it, he didn't have her authority to file the lawsuit in her name. Um, that that was one of the few little, that, that, was, that was the lawyer in me saying, that's not how you, you do it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that you know, if she hadn't changed her mind, you know, he he could have had serious re repercussions. He could have had a very short legal career. He's he's to me he's the star of the show because he found an impossible situation and undertook to write it right down to the end, and um, that was that was really fantastic that he did that, and he you know. The, to the ex extent that he's achieved a claim uh, among the profession um, and, and among the public, uh, he deserves it. He deserves it because he stuck to it. And I think, you know, for most of the time he put in, um, he had no real prospect of, of being paid. Oh, no, no. But he ended up being, being because it worked out, he yeah, paid pretty handsomely. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so I, you know, I, I mean, I think it's clear from our discussion that um, it's it's a worthy comparison, really an important comparison, to compare these two movies. And you know, I, I hope we've done a decent job at it. I mean, there's, there's more if you look at Mark Golan, you know, versus the, uh, I mean, the the filmmaker of the French movie, and um, <clears throat> as against uh, the players and organizers of the. Uh, you know, producers and directors of the American movie. Um, and it's, it's a lot different. And oh, totally it, it, different stylistically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, the, you know, so I think from our discussion, it would seem to me that we are likely to rate the, um, the Woman in Gold, the American movie, um, with Helen Mirren as a much better movie uh, and yes. a story and viewing experience and all that than the French movie. But what, what, how would you, Rate them comparatively, Steve. Well, no, I think you, you just summed it up. I mean, the um, because the characters in the French film, there really isn't anybody that that you you, you truly like. Um, you respect what the what the woman is doing, but um, but there isn't any character in there who, who you you at the end of the film go. Gee, yeah, that, that was that was really an interesting person. I'm I'm glad I I, I had an interaction with them. Where in in the Women in Gold, uh, Maria herself is a fascinating woman, and and the lawyer, uh, it it just uh, the difference between the two is is, is quite different. Uh, you know, maybe the French film is like a C plus as opposed to an A minus. A woman in gold. Yeah. Well, on a scale of ten, uh, what would you give the one, and what would you give the other? Um, maybe a, a, a six to the, the art dealer, and um, a nine to woman in gold. Hmm. I'm close. I, I would give a six, uh, or possibly a five and a half to the art dealer, only because I. I, I I thought it was uh, there was something so cold about the film, even in the one moment where she 
if you remember, she burst out in a, in a cemetery, and All she, right. she revealed, um, you know, the 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 fellow who had stolen the art, told everyone in the family the story. That was uh, that was the most powerful part of that movie, but it wasn't all that powerful. And then they all walked away, and and uh, all the characters, you know, re remained the same. You know that that's the thing, that's the thing about literature and movies in general. You want to see a dynamic in the character. You want to see the character learn something. You want to see the character change, evolve. Uh, you want to have a handle on that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I don't, with the end of that uh, art dealer movie, I think they were all, they all went back to where they had been. <laughs> including yeah, the only difference was they had, they, they, who, who had possession of the art changed. Uh, yeah. But yeah, in terms of the individuals, no, I mean, there, there, there really wasn't any, any growth. Uh, where yeah. where the, you could even, the women go, I mean, um, the, the 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 lawyer clearly grew a lot during the course. He matured a lot as the, the movie went on and along. Well, and and Maria Altman, you know, found herself in a way. Um, she right. was on a search all her life to try to, um, you know, recover something out of the family life in Vienna, and she did, um, and get it into the United States, and she did. So there's a dynamic there. The Austrians, you know, I mean, you never really met them, but the Austrians had a dynamic. They, they, they ruled in her favor. There was a dynamic and, there. They were saying, "Look, you know, we recognize, we understand, we acknowledge, uh, and we will give her the benefit." And uh, that was a dynamic there for sure. So I, I thought, I thought uh, that was a, a ten movie, uh, "Woman in Gold." Uh, and I think it's it's uh, even better than a ten. So, I, but your idea to compare them, Steve, and I, I I'm so glad we did, and I hope we can find other comparisons going forward, um, because this kind of discussion is uh, uh, very valuable, especially when the movies are covering the same, you know, um, the same general area of history, human human activity. But they are so different in so many ways. A great comparison. Yeah. And of course, the underlying subject matter, the, the monument men, um, about what the, what the U.S. government itself did during World War II to try to preserve the art. Uh, the, uh, the, the, that, that was a, a very entertaining movie. Uh, not the usual World War II movie. And they spoke of it, or Schoenberg spoke of it. Um, you know, in in his remarks, the, the monument men. But I guess if you if you uh, if you shake it and bake it, um, I come away with a perhaps a better understanding of the value of art to people and to museums, um, and how and how it can be such a tremendous part of our society. To have art, which, which is, um, you know, so important. Oh yeah, and it reminds me that this this art, when it was sold to Louder, I guess, the yes. woman in gold, uh, it was at an auction, right? right? And it was uh, sold at a very very high price. Oprah oh, bought hers, her version, uh, at auction, but wasn't that a private sale? I, mean, and I, a, I don't know. You're right. There was one of them was an auction. The other was a private sale. Yeah. yeah. Suffice to say that you have to have plenty of money to enjoy art like this. And it goes, it really is um, to Laura's credit that he puts it in a museum. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was something in excess of 70 million he paid for it. Yeah. And um, a lot of that is because it had such a history. Right? Yeah. It was more yeah. than just a, a work of art. I mean, a very quality work of art, but it had interaction with, with with the art. And one of the positive things, actually, in the art is is very early in the movie when when the father sees the picture that he had seen as, as when he was a three year old. 
and how he brought back both the memory. The, the, the early scenes in the art dealer, um, before you really learn what the whole family is really about, actually um, are, are more entertaining than the latter part, you know, the, 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 the movie ends with the recovery of the art. Of the art. Um, but at least you had a very human reaction, you know, because he hadn't seen it in 40 years or some extended time, timeline. So oh, there, there's there it is. We'll have to close on that. And the point you you raise is that art uh, can be uh, extraordinarily humanizing to a group, to a family, to a community, or yeah. it can be dehumanizing uh, and uh, just as easily. And we saw both sides of that. Thank you so much, Steve. Steve Goodman, our movie reviewer and lawyer. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more. And I really enjoy this discussion. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.